Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Lipkin. I'm the John Snow Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University in the Center for Infection and Immunity. Uh, this uh, broadcast is coming to you from the campus of Columbia Uni University in the city of New York. Uh, I'd like to say it's a beautiful day here in New York, but there is some rain, but there's a little bit of blue just peeking through, which I think is a wonderful metaphor uh, for the morning. <laughs> I'd like to introduce uh, up here um, at the desk uh, my colleagues in this study. Not everyone could attend today, but we have a good representation. Harvey Alter, raise your hand, Harvey, so everyone knows who you are. Judy Mikovits, Frank Roschetti, and Mady Hornig. Uh, Harvey is with the NIH. Judy is with uh, Private Consulting Group, formerly with WPI. And Frank Roschetti is also with the National Institutes of Health. I'd also like to acknowledge the help we've had today from our coordinators Amir Bhatt, Afia Genfi, and uh, Sikhan Akpan. I'm going to begin today with a brief overview of the study, and we'll follow that with a question and answer period. Now, we know that many of you who are not here would also like to pose questions. You're going to be able to do so. The journalists among you already know the website, but for those of you who are calling in from outside or writing in from outside, it's www.cii.columbia.edu. That's World Wide Web. Center for Infection Immunity, Columbia.edu. Look at the latest news channel and that will take you to our broadcast and give you an opportunity to pose questions. A chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis is an unexplained incapacitating syndrome that afflicts at least a million people in the United States. For many years, there's been the thought that it could be attributed to an infectious process of some sort because many of the individuals with this syndrome have malaise, night sweats, lymphadenopathy, sore throat, and fever. And there have been a wide range of microbes that have been proposed as causative agents, herpes viruses, boronaviruses, Borrelia, uh, but none has really captured the attention of the scientific community and of the patient population more than retroviruses. And in fact, Recent reports relating to those has resulted in patents, diagnostic tests, therapeutic regimens, promises of vaccines, and concern over the safety of the blood supply. The two key papers relating to retroviruses were published uh, in reports by colleagues, um, some of my colleagues here today, initially Judy Mikovits, Frank Roschetti, and their colleagues at the WPI and at the NCI. Uh, in 2009, and then Harvey Alter and Shiloh and others at the National Institutes of Health a few months later. Now, the viruses they discussed were somewhat different, but they really fell into fairly similar uh, classification, and not important really to get into the details of viral taxonomy. It's simply important to say that these were retroviruses uh, that were related, and they were distinctive in many ways. Subsequent publications from many but not all groups uh, that looked into the question of whether or not these viruses could be associated with these disorders, for the most part, failed to replicate those findings. Nonetheless, um, none of those studies had the power that was required to, uh, you know, to in incontrovertibly refute the association between those viruses and disease. Furthermore, they did not offer the investigators who had done that initial work an opportunity to use their best, method, best methods in, in sorting out the challenge. So almost two years ago now, with support from uh, Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Harold Varmus, director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, Thomas Frieden, director of the Centers for Disease Control, and Peggy Hamburg, commissioner of the FDA, we initiated a study to look into this question uh, in an in a absolutely clear-cut fashion. And many of you have already received the press release that describes our findings, so I'm just going to talk about it very briefly. Before doing so, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did the work involved in this study. We had six clinical investigators distributed geographical sites across the United States. Anthony Komaroff in Boston, Dan Peterson in Nevada, Nancy Klimas, in Miami, Jose Montoya in Palo Alto, Sue Levine in New York, and uh, Lucinda Bateman in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, they worked tirelessly first to define the clinical criteria that will be used in the study. We used the Fukuda criteria, the Canadian criteria. We tried to hedge 
the uh, study in every which way so that we could favor an infectious hypothesis, one word, one to be present. Why that will be important will come up in a moment. And then the laboratories were led by, uh, efforts were led by Shiling Lo at the FDA, Harvey Alter here on the podium, Bill Switzer at the Centers for Disease Control, Judy Mikevitz, Frank Rochetti, and uh, Maureen Hansen of Cornell University who can't be with us today. The results of the genetic tests, which were chiefly PCR, and people use whatever methods they wanted to use, uh, found no evidence of XMRV or related viruses in either the subjects with chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, or the controls. There was, in fact, uh, a finding of some antibody responses. We don't really know what that means. In approximately 6% of the controls and 6% of the experimental subjects, not experimental subjects, but subjects with disease, but again, there was no association between the presence of those antibodies and disease, and we don't really know the validity of those particular tests because we don't have defined positive control here with which to work. Now, many in the community have written me over the past 12 hours since there have been leaks about the press release and the findings of the paper um, with dismay. Uh, with concern that this meant the end of CFS ME research, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, everyone here uh, at this podium, scientists around the world, are committed to solving this problem. It is likely to be a constellation of disorders, not necessarily a single agent, be it viral, bacterial, or otherwise. The samples that were collected during the course of this project will be an extraordinary resource for addressing questions related to the causes, the treatment, the management, the pathogenesis, the basic sciences of these disorders. And these samples have been collected. They are stored in ultra-low freezers. They will be released to qualified investigators who make application through the National Institutes of Health. I am also informed that there are at least three active grant opportunities that will allow people to get support to study these materials. So this has been a highly leveraged study. The other thing I want to say is that it took extraordinary courage on the part of Drs. Alter, Mikevitz, and Rochetti to participate in the study, to see it through to its conclusion, to actually say, we now believe based on the day that we've obtained that this first report may have been misleading. They, too, are committed to continuing to work on this problem and on this challenge. And I can say that in all my years of doing science, I cannot think of a single instance where an investigator came back, went through this sort of a process, and then stood up and said, I want to be counted. I don't want to admit that we made an error here, but I'm committed to moving forward and being public and forthright with the science. I'm going to make one, I'm going to read one quote from Judy Mikovits, which I think is representative of what many people say, who participated in the study. I greatly appreciated the opportunity to fully participate in this unprecedented study, unprecedented because of the level of collaboration, the integrity of the investigators, and the commitments of the National Institutes of Health to provide its considerable resources to the CFS community for this important study. Although I am disappointed that we found no association of XMRV, PMLV to CFS, the silver lining is that our 2009 science report resulted in global awareness of this crippling disease and has sparked new interest in CFS research. I am dedicated to continuing to work with leaders in the field of pathogen discovery in the effort to determine the etiological agent for CFS. And Judy, I think that was extraordinary, and I applaud you for that. I'm going to open the floor now for questions. I'll start with people in the audience. Please pose them to me so that I can then refer them to people. What I want to make certain is that we have a, an orderly process by which we get these questions answered. And Secon, you will be providing me with uh, questions that come in via the web. Yes? OK. Hillary, let me, give you a, let me give you a microphone because I want to make certain that everyone can hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Hillary Johnson. Um, Dr. Lipkin, the, these patients have uh, tended to be very ill for many years, even decades, some of them, and there's been a lot of evidence for infection over the years. 
uh, might there not potentially uh, be retroviral infection in tissues other than blood, such as spleen, liver, thyroid, lymph nodes, lymph nodes, uh, gut lymphoid tissues, etc. Is, is that out of the question, or is that something to be dis explored in the future? In science and medicine, you can never say never. I mean, that's part of, the, part of the nature of what we do. The question, of course, is when you put a study like this in, in operation, you're testing work that has previously been reported. And in the initial reports, the findings were, in fact, in blood. So where would one stop? You could, you could survey virtually the entire body. And then you could make the argument that this was not one of those individuals. We need to do another 100 and so forth. So what we try to do in designing studies to look at the likelihood of association of a factor with a disease is to examine the first paper which came out which described this finding to make certain that we have the power to at least replicate that with a fair margin. And that's the approach we took. But you're correct. I cannot say that there is no person anywhere in the world who is not infected with a retrovirus in some organ that we have not sampled. But I don't see any way in which we can formally and practically test that hypothesis. Would anyone like to add anything further from the, uh, from the group? Harvey? Yeah, I, I might say, again, it is theoretically possible, but uh, I think, look, uh, Ian made the key point that we were trying to re evaluate existing findings and could not confirm them, but it would be extremely unusual to have a systemic illness that may have begun in any organ not to spill into the, the blood or to, into leukocyte preparation. So while well, theoretically possible, is really not too reasonable. I, I want to add one point in follow-up, and that is the samples to which I alluded just a moment ago will be studied, are in fact being studied, using high-throughput genetic methods in an effort to find agents as well as host biomarkers that may be indicative of disease. And in fact, if there are retroviruses that we missed using these primer sets, for example, we would hope that we would capture them using these very deep sequencing methods. In addition, there will be people who will be using immunological methods um, this is not work that we would do, but others have already proposed this, that would get at questions of serology and whether or not there's previous infection and immune responses that support that hypothesis. There is an independent effort. We have some 300 samples that will be uh, studied using this approach, 150 from cases and 150 from controls, a bit less, but that's about roughly where we are. That's uh, under the auspices of the Hutchins Family Foundation, which has an even larger cohort. In addition to doing bloods, that group is also going to be looking at uh, metagenomics. It's going to be looking at fecal flora to see whether or not there's some changes in the microbiome, which might also be associated with disease.